Morning, everyone. I see some familiar faces in the room. I'm curious, uh, how many of you have actually used the AWS Ground Station service? All right, great. This, hopefully you'll be inspired to do so. I'm Russ Healy and with me this morning are Nate McGuirt and Kent Sarf and we're gonna talk to you today about making the most of the AWS Ground Station service. Our goal today is to get you familiar with AWS Ground Station and give you enough detail to understand how it works, uh, whether it's a fit for your needs and also how to get started with the service. AWS Ground Station is a fully managed service that we launched in 2019 to give our customers an alternative to building their own Ground Station infrastructure. Uh, AWS Ground Station takes advantage of AWS features like our global network and our serverless and event-driven services to give you fast and cost-effective ways to build on your satellite's capabilities. Fundamentally, AWS Ground Station connects your satellites with AWS regions in X-band and S-band so that you can ingest and process your satellite data as quickly as possible. With full access to AWS services to help you innovate, because we're all about the art of the possible. It also lets you uplink and control your satellites in S-band. We're always seeking to understand what customers want in our services. And these are a few of the features that we've launched in AWS Ground Station. We'll get into a bit more depth on these features uh, later today and especially uh, Amazon S3 data delivery, cross-region data delivery. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about licensing accelerator. Also, we have new features coming uh, and you can expect that to continue as well as we innovate on behalf of our customers. So in brief, these are the building blocks of AWS Ground Station. Uh, in the upcoming sections, we'll cover the control plane, which is used in onboarding and contact scheduling, and the data plane, which is used in delivering data. And then you build your processing and distribution uh, portion, right? What Basically what you want to use that data to, to do and how, who you want to deliver it to. AWS Ground Station is designed for satellite owners and operators who need a way to connect to their low Earth orbit satellites with the AWS global network. It's ideal for those customers with Earth observation workloads in low Earth orbits, but it can support higher altitude orbits if the link budgets allow, and we can help you with making that determination. Uh, AWS Ground Station is not designed for customers who want to consume satellite data that's being collected by someone else. For those requirements, there are alternatives such as AWS Open Data where you can obtain that type of data. If you've visited the AWS Ground Station website, you've seen this map. This is uh, our, our region coverage for the AWS Ground Station service. When we launched AWS Ground Station in 2019, we offered it in two regions, US West 2 and US East 2. And today we have 10 with more regions on the way. Uh, we recognize that AWS Ground Station customers need region support that provides the kind of coverage that they need for their satellite missions. And it also brings some challenges like how to handle processing satellite data centrally. So to save customers cost and complexity, we developed a feature called cross-region data delivery, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. A couple of noteworthy things on, on this uh, graphic. You'll notice if you're familiar with the AWS global infrastructure that most of the AWS ground station regions are co-located with AWS regions. So, uh, you know, where we have availability zones in clusters of data centers, our ground station sites in some cases are directly co-located and in other cases they're, they're very close, right? So we have very low latency, that's our primary uh, goal with the service. But there's a couple of places where we have ground station coverage uh, that's not directly adjacent to an AWS region and those are Hawaii, which is homed to Oregon and Punta Arenas, which is homed to Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, also, one other thing that's kind of useful to know about 
The onboarding process, we'll get into licensing just a little bit more, uh, but a couple sites on this map, uh, we have higher, uh, or I should say, quicker turnaround for licensing, right? We have multiple different regulatory domains on this map, and that creates uh, some interesting uh, additional hurdles for customers as they're getting onboarded. Uh, it's helpful to know that, that Ireland and Bahrain and Cape Town typically have the fastest licensing turnaround. So we will typically onboard customers uh, who want to use those regions sooner and then do kind of a rolling onboarding uh, for other regions as the licenses come in. More regions are in development now, and our future regions are based on what our customers tell us they need, based on things like their satellite orbits and geographic distribution. And because low Earth orbiting satellites illuminate a relatively small footprint uh, at any given time, many customers ask us for more coverage so they can achieve more throughput. And they also ask for specific frequency bands. And we would love to know more about your needs. Before you can begin using the AWS Ground Station service, you need to have at least one satellite onboarded to your account. For broadcast satellites, AWS has licensing in place, so we can onboard them for you quickly uh, to get started. For onboarding your own satellites, you first need to license them and provide us with the information we need to license our sites. So in satellite licensing, you need to license the satellite itself. We need to license our ground station sites for that satellite, the sites that you want to use. And we can provide you with a template for that process. For customers that have not dealt with licensing before, we offer a feature in preview called Licensing Accelerator, and it provides you with a guided walkthrough and prescriptive guidance on how to obtain your satellite licenses. Licensing is, again, driven by local authorities. In some locations, it's, it's a long road uh, compared to others. So we encourage you to get your information to us earlier uh, rather than later. And some regions take weeks, as we talked about. Uh, and we'll cover the terms on this slide uh, in more depth in, in the next few slides. Many customers ask us how we track satellites. Most satellites have a published NORAD ID and orbital elements for those satellites are available from a number of public sources. Those orbital elements, also known as ephemerides, allow us to track satellites and predict the times that they'll be in range for each of our AWS ground station locations. And that's what drives the scheduling options that you'll see on the ground station console. Sometimes customer satellites don't have publicly available tracking elements, or they may not be updated often enough uh, to be uh, current. And for that use case, we've been asked for a feature that allows customers to provide their own orbital elements. And we'd like to hear from you if you have that use case also. The scheduling interface on AWS Ground Station on the console lets you select upcoming contacts for a given mission profile. We'll talk more about mission profiles shortly, and a satellite NORAD ID, and the regions where uh, that satellite has been onboarded. From this interface, you can schedule contacts, cancel contacts, and you can see the status of past contacts. To use the console or the scheduling API, you need at least one satellite onboarded to your AWS account, and you need to have deployed an AWS ground station configuration which is a set of resources including a mission profile and a delivery endpoint such as an EC2 instance or an S3 bucket. And one thing that you'll notice here is that the satellite catalog number, which is the NORAD ID, is selectable separately from the mission profile. And this is valuable in a couple of contexts. We have customers who have um, fleets of satellites that use the same mission profile so they can select one NORAD ID with the mission profile. We also have customers who want to use a satellite to deliver data for a particular contact to EC2 and for another contact to S3. So we provide that flexibility through the, the scheduling API. And you can choose whether to deploy your mission profiles and delivery endpoints using one AWS region or multiple regions. And from there, if you choose to use cross-region data delivery for AWS Ground Station, your contact data can be delivered to central resources like an S3 bucket or an EC2 instance, or you can process that data 
uh, in a distributed way. So you have a choice. You can either distribute, uh, you can process it locally in the region for the lowest latency, or you can deliver it to a central location and process it all there. And because we offer cross-region data delivery with AWS Ground Station at no additional charge, you can architect your processing solution in the way that makes the most sense for you without having to worry about the additional cost of cross-region data delivery. A mission profile, one of the terms you've seen on the screen here, um, is the core of the AWS ground station configuration. It's what defines the RF parameters of the satellite uh, and where we should deliver the data that you downlink. If you're doing uplink telecommand and control or TTNC, the mission profile also defines the uplink parameters. Note that licensing and onboarding for uplink is separate from downlink. It's, it's in addition to that. You need to specify an endpoint in your mission profile, and that endpoint defines where the data is delivered for a particular contact. Your mission profile can specify either an S3 bucket or a network interface uh, connected to an instance running a software-defined radio where you demodulate and decode your data. Let's take a look at what goes into the mission profile. The essential elements uh, of the mission profile, though not all of them are, are shown here, the RF parameters of the satellite's radio system make up one part of it, and the AWS resources make up the other part. We'll go through some examples later in the presentation. Uh, for now, one thing to make note of is that we provide you with the ability to use EventBridge to trigger uh, the power management of an EC2 instance. So for example, your EC2 instance doesn't have to be running all the time. It can be turned on during pre-pass, you run through the contact, process your data, and then it, it can be powered off again. Um, and those times are adjustable, uh, the pre-pass and post-pass timers are adjustable through the API for a given mission profile to allow more time for an EC2 instance to boot, for example. Here's some of the details in the mission profile. The RF parameters are shown on the left side and the demodulation and decoding settings are shown on the right. And these are segments of a mission profile uh, for use with one of the broadcast satellites that I mentioned earlier. And now to get into the data plan, I'd like to turn it over to Nate McGuirt. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's dive in. So uh, we're gonna be looking through the data plane here and talking about how you receive data from AWS Ground Station, how you transmit data through AWS Ground Station, and uh, how you might integrate AWS down st Ground Station with downstream processing. Try not to mix those words together here. So where I wanna start off is uh, a little bit of flow chart to walk through uh, what I'm gonna call delivery options. So there's two different formats uh, that Ground Station can provide data in. Uh, one is uh, DigiF, so digitized intermediate frequency, where we're down converting uh, that RF waveform and then literally digitizing it, sampling it, and delivering you the raw samples. Um, that gives additional flexibility because it means that the data hasn't yet been demodulated. So in that mode, and we'll look at some architectures for this, you can bring your own software-defined radio and effectively have your choice of, of the type of radio you want to use, um, different brands, et cetera. Uh, for your mission. The other option is um, demodulated frames. So in certain modes of operation, uh, AWS Ground Station does the demodulation and decoding on your behalf, for example, like that uh, configuration that Russ showed on the previous slide. Now, um, what I'm showing here in this flowchart is depending on the configuration of your mission, you have different choices for which of those will be available to you. First choice is band. So in, X, in S band, uh, we deliver that digitized IF, uh, so that digitized RF waveform. In X band, the choices depend on your bandwidth. Uh, so in narrow band, if you're uh, under that bandwidth limit, you have your choice of either. You can let AWS Ground Station do the demodulation and decoding uh, on your behalf, or you can select DigiF and we'll send you the raw digitized waveform and you can bring your own SDR. 
Uh, today, in wideband, uh, you have to use AWS GrantStation to do the demodulation and decoding over that bandwidth limit uh, for X-band downlinks. Uh, now, something Russ mentioned on an earlier slide, there's a preview feature uh, that we've announced uh, called Wideband DigiF, and that's where that fits is at the top. So when that uh, becomes generally available, you'll have a second option all the way up to the, the bandwidth limit there to be able to receive that data in a uh, digitized, uh, intermediate frequency representation, meaning that uh, for, for like wideband payload downlinks, uh, you will also be able to bring your own SDR rather than uh, using the radios that are available in AWS Ground Station. So how does the data actually get into the environment, uh, uh, into your cloud environment? There's two different delivery types, synchronous delivery and asynchronous delivery. Uh, we'll talk about synchronous delivery first. So in synchronous delivery, we deliver the data to you, and, and this is the same for both uh, demodulated frames and for DigiF, uh, digitized waveform. Uh, we deliver the data to you over the network uh, in your VPC. Uh, so a, a private network that you can configure and control in the AWS environment. Uh, the delivery format for that is a UDP protocol called VITA 49.2. Uh, that's a, um, a standard that provides and captures certain useful metadata uh, about the configuration of the radios, the different channels, et cetera. So we use the VITA 49.2 protocol, um, UDP based over the network. AWS Ground Station, when you configure it, creates a network interface face in your VPC, and in your mission profile, you configure a target that you would like it to deliver that data to, and that's where those network streams will arrive. In this example, uh, on the top half of the slide, uh, we're doing DigiF, so the next stop is an EC2 instance, which is a pretty typical configuration. That EC2 instance is running a software radio that's responsible for the demodulation and decoding, and then those demodded and decoded frames are passed onward to mission data processing, a front-end process, or just whatever's appropriate uh, next step down in the signal chain. On the bottom, we have asynchronous delivery, and this is a newer feature uh, we've released in the last couple of years. So the way asynchronous delivery works is you continue to receive that same data, and it's valid for those same two data options we were talking about earlier, but instead of receiving it uh, near real-time streaming over the network, we batch those Vita 49 packets uh, that contain your frames or your samples into PCAP files, packet capture files. It's basically, you can think of it like a recording of the downlink, and we batch those up and we deliver them to an S3 bucket of your choosing in object storage. And we do that in batches across the length of the contact. So you don't have to wait until the contact is over to get the first batch. But basically, instead of sort of streaming them to you over the network as um, real-time UDP packets, we're packaging those UDP packets up and writing them to persistent storage. Um, and you get your choice. You can do that completely unattended, and you can come back to that storage and pick up that downlink later. Or you could build an event-driven architecture that as the batches get written to S3, you can pick those up and process them kind of in a micro batch approach in near real time. It just depends on what the requirements are for the mission. But the, the key here is that you can, in the asynchronous mode, you can run it effectively unattended. Uh, we will capture that recording and write it to persistent storage for you, and you can come back for it when you're ready for it. So, uh, also want to talk a little bit about, and Russ alluded to this earlier, uh, about a, a feature we've talked about that's now uh, available called cross-region delivery. Um, so what this means is that AWS Ground Station will move data. Uh, basically, it will allow you to specify that you want a downlink or an uplink um, to happen from a region other than the antenna system you're scheduling. Let me make that real for you and give you an example. Let's say that uh, because of where you are in orbit, you want to uh, schedule a contact in Bahrain, but you want to have your processing infrastructure in US West 2 in Oregon. Um, this feature allows you to specify exactly that and say, I want to take the contact on antenna systems uh, in Bahrain, but I don't want to stand up my processing infrastructure in that region. AWS Ground Station will backhaul the traffic across our uh, private global backbone network and deliver it to you in the region of your choosing. 
Um, there's a couple of things to trades to think about there, right? There's some additional latency involved in doing that. Obviously, propagation delay, you know, speed of light through glass, it takes time uh, for the signal to, to travel around the world. Potentially also additional buffering just to make sure that those connections are stable when we start moving them across a bigger network. Um, so, you know, for applications where that sort of latency between the antenna face and the software radios or the processing infrastructure is really sensitive down to, you know, single digits or tens of milliseconds, you have the option to uh, deploy in the region with the antennas, as Russ was talking about earlier, for missions that aren't sensitive to that and benefit from the convenience of being able to have centralized processing and backhaul all the traffic to one place, that's a good use case for uh, cross-region delivery. The same thing is available in the asynchronous delivery format, right? This is uh, a little easier to reason about. That just looks like saying, hey, I've got a bucket in this region. I want that recording delivered to this bucket in this region, even if that's not necessarily the region where you're taking the contact. Um, an additional note, or an additional note, um, Typically, the regions that are available are going to be regions that have ground station deployed in them for cross-region delivery. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions to that. One, for example, is US East 1, so you can have cross-region delivery done to the US East 1 region, even though there is not a ground station location homed to US East 1. But general rule of thumb, uh, the delivery regions that are available are, are available are gonna be regions that have AWS ground station deployed in them. Uh, another note is talking about government cloud, so it's possible to uh, do downlinks into GovCloud, leave the data encrypted and move it over, but that's something that has to be done on the customer side today. So AWS Ground Station doesn't have a set of ground stations tied to the GovCloud regions, and uh, cross-region delivery today isn't supported to GovCloud. Um, we've got architectures to help. I've worked with customers who have live space missions right now uh, where they're moving the data into GovCloud where they decrypt it and handle their payloads or, or do their uh, telemetry tracking and control. Uh, so if that's your use case, reach out to us. We're happy to help you out with it. Uh, additionally, for missions where you might need to move that data across some sort of cross-domain solution into an air-gapped environment, happy to talk about how we can support there as well. So what does this look like, uh, maybe with a little bit of a, a notional mission to kind of try to make this more real? Um, this example is synchronous delivery on both sides. So what we have here on the bottom flow is um, uh, tracking telemetry and control, both uplink and downlink. So uh, presumably uh, we are you know, commanding the spacecraft to do a downlink and monitoring the telemetry from the spacecraft as the downlink proceeds in the bottom flow. Uh, so uh, we're in S-band there. Uh, that means we're getting that digitized uh, IF for both uplink and downlink. Um, so the first stop there is a software radio that's responsible for the modulation and demodulation and, and encoding and decoding. Um, Output input from that is demodulated frames, from there onto our front end processor, and from there onto uh, our command and control system or, or whatever's kind of appropriate for the mission. In the top half, uh, we're receiving a payload downlink. Uh, so that's wider bandwidth, that's 325 megahertz, that puts us into wideband territory. So in that case, AWS Ground Station is doing the demodulation and decoding uh, with, ground, or with radios that are a part of AWS Ground Station. So we receive demodulated frames from the service. Uh, we have those delivered straight to our front end processor uh, that takes care of extracting whatever that payload may look like and then passing it on to uh, whatever system's appropriate for payload data processing. I, I've shown that here is EC2 instances. There's lots of great things in the cloud you could bring to bear for your payload processing, but for the sake of brevity, we've just shown it here as EC2 instances, and we'll look at some other things you might do with that data downstream uh, and some architecture slides coming up. So uh, similar architecture, but looking at the asynchronous delivery uh, perspective this time. So the TTNC connection down at the bottom is the same. We're doing the same thing. We're commanding the spacecraft to downlink and we're monitoring it across the contact. Um, but on the top half, we've replaced that real-time processing infrastructure with uh, recording delivered to S3. Uh, so back to some of the reasons you might do that that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, maybe that's unattended. Maybe you actually need to get downlinks from two or three different spacecraft before it's useful to process them because they need to be processed in conjunction with one another, um, uh, et cetera. Um, so um, another option for um, uh, how to set up that configuration. 
So uh, another kind of example architecture. This is something that we've built and operated. This is actually something that uh, a few of us did is a workshop uh, at a previous AWS summit. Unfortunately, we're not doing that workshop uh, here this go round, but we're gonna talk a little bit about the architecture we built for it. So um, what we're looking at here, and I've got this kind of arranged as a data flow. On the next slide, we'll look at kind of a top-down architecture view, which actually has a lot less moving parts um, in it. But um, what we're doing here is, is in the four different columns, receiving a, a downlink and doing kind of the initial processing of that downlink, uh, taking that downlink and processing it into imagery, um, performing some machine learning inference, running a computer vision algorithm on that imagery, and then generating output products and publishing them so a set of data users can access them. And, and I'm gonna walk you through the different steps and then we'll look at the architecture to support it. So, uh, like I said, this is, this is one we've really built uh, and exercised before, so happy to talk in detail if there's questions about it as we get towards the end. Uh, but essentially what we did is we took a downlink uh, from uh, JPSS1. Um, those broadcast constantly, so it's a great thing to be able to do demos against because anytime you can get a pass with JPSS1, you can pull down data uh, and you can generate imagery, so that's what we were doing here. Um, as the pass was happening, as Russ talked about earlier, we used AWS Event Bridge that stood up uh, an EC2 instance running uh, NASA's RTSTPS, open source software uh, that can extract uh, the CCSDS frames from that downlink, uh, and, uh, or actually not extract the frames, extract the sensor data records from those frames. So it generates SDRs, effectively the sensor data that came off the payload instrument on the spacecraft. In this case, we were working with an instrument called VIRS extracting those sensor data records and writing them back to S3. Uh, as that output file was written to S3, that created an event through EventBridge that started the next step of processing. Uh, in this case, the next step of processing was we used a service called AWS Batch. AWS Batch spun up a EC2 instance. On that EC2 instance, it then deployed a containerized task, and that in that container was running uh, software, another open source product called CSPP. Um, uh, VIRS SDR and Polar to Grid, and that's a pair of tools that are able to take those sensor data records from the VIRS instrument and generate output imagery. In this case, the output product was a true color geotiff, uh, showing the, the area that the spacecraft had covered during the pass. Um, so the output from the stage of processing was that true color geotiff, uh, and the container wrote it back to S3 when it was done. Batch takes care of the rest of the messy business of cleaning up the container and tearing down the compute infrastructure when it's no longer needed. Um, that creates another event bridge event that kicks off the next stages of processing. So in that case, we used a AWS step functions workflow and that step functions workflow uh, paired with a, a pair of Lambda functions it was using uh, ran that true color image through a computer vision algorithm that we had built and deployed with our SageMaker machine learning service. Um, that was pretty simple. Really what we were doing was cloud detection. Uh, so we had that algorithm trained to just generate a cloud mask, uh, a second image to go along with the original source image. Um, once it had completed that, the last Lambda function packaged the two together and basically created a zip archive with the original GeoTIFF and a image for where the algorithm perceived that there was cloud cover in the imagery. Um, packaged the two of those up together and wrote the output data back to S3 for users to be able to pick up uh, and take and analyze. And that's sort of the whole end to end flow. So actual execution of this whole pipeline from start of contact to having the output products in hand, depending on the length of the pass, about 35 minutes, um, about 10 minutes of that was the pass, about 20 minutes of that was processing once the pass was complete to kind of go from starting a pass to spitting out uh, output imagery at the end of a pipeline. And here is a top-down view uh, of what that architecture looked like. Uh, like I said, kind of simplified when we're not talking about all the different kind of steps and iterations that it needs to go through. Uh, essentially, you've got on the left-hand side the kind of real-time uh, downlink stream to extract the payload data from that particular instrument we were interested in and, and get it into S3. And from that point onward, S3 really becomes the hub of the architecture. Uh, each time a, you know, as the products, uh, you know, as you go through and create different uh, interim products, as those interim products get written to S3, um, we get a new event bridge event, and that is what initiates the next step of processing to generate the next product. Uh, and so when we're finished, we have that final product, but we also, if we choose to keep them, have all the interim products as they went through the pipeline waiting for us in S3, so we can kind of inspect them as they go through, or if those were going different places, we could split off and, and have each of those interim products go to the different users that need them. 
And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kent, who's going to talk to you a little bit about how AWS can help you get started. Thanks, Nate. Quick show of hands. Uh, how many people are interested in uh, putting, putting together a solution using AWS Ground Station? Fantastic. How many of you would like some assistance doing that? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, uh, and the service has absolutely, been absolutely fantastic at growing and adapting to customer need ever since it was launched in 2019. Um, I lead a team of ProServe professional services consultants that works with customers and partners to implement their mission solutions on GroundStation, um, in addition to doing uh, mission data processing solutions and mission operations on AWS. Um, there are lots of uh, free resources, lots of uh, ways to get up to speed quickly on, on how to use GroundStation, and one of the things that we provide in addition to all that is direct assistance uh, for you and your teams. So a little bit about ProServe uh, as we get going here. Uh, ProServe is very high touch. Uh, we work with you and your team side by side uh, uh, to build solutions, get you to outcomes quicker than you could probably do on your own. Um, we uh, uh, have a holistic perspective about how we work with you. Uh, of course, we're interested in the technical aspects of what you're trying to do, but we also are focused on making sure that people are trained and ready to uh, continue development and operations of these systems. Uh, we uh, can also help you with security, compliance, and resiliency, improving all those capabilities uh, as we deliver. In a lot of cases, we help customers who are brand new to AWS with getting their first landing zone uh, put in place with the right uh, governance and controls uh, to make sure that it's suitable for um, the workload that we're considering around your mission, but could be expanded into other things as well as time goes on. Uh, we do this because we've worked with several thousand customers uh, in uh, doing everything from brand new innovation to migration projects uh, to helping them transform into digital businesses. And so we've got an engagement model that uh, works well with you no matter where you're coming from. Uh, and the good news is my team gets to focus on just the space and spacecraft solutions. Uh, so we bring that subject matter expertise and industry background to bear. And the good news is you get to benefit from that experience. Um, ProServe works closely with uh, all the partners in the APN and uh, in the Amazon Partner Network, I'm sorry. And uh, we work with them to train them, develop their skills and capabilities. And in particular, partners uh, uh, have a very big role to play uh, when it comes to uh, ground station based solutions because uh, they bring SDRs uh, to the table with us. So uh, as Nate mentioned and as Russ mentioned before, there's lots of options for how to um, handle both uplink and downlink with SDRs. There's lots of SDR vendors. There's some shareware vendors um, uh, of, of SDR based solutions and uh, we've worked with many of them and are broadening that experience base with more and more customer projects. So. A little bit uh, about uh, the kind of offerings we do. And certainly ProServe can work on a custom bespoke, bespoke basis with you, but over the last few years since the Ground Station service um, uh, was launched, we've developed some patterns that address what we see most common in the market. Uh, the first one is called First Contact. And First Contact is all about uh, uh, training you and your team to use AWS Ground Station in ways that are cloud optimized. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in, in subsequent slides on these. First Mission is uh, taking the foundation provided by First Contact and building up and deploying with your team uh, the, uh, the custom end-to-end -end uplink, downlink uh, solution required for your, your mission. Uh, sometimes that's S-band only, sometimes it's a combination of S and X. Um, uh, but uh, we have uh, bring our experience to bear uh, with uh, the, the patterns we've seen work and steering you away from anti-patterns that we know could lead to trouble uh, down the line. And then um, for customers who um, are interested in flying uh, new or novel radios, uh, we have a radio compatibility offering uh, where we bring a test kit on site, connect it to, uh, uh, to your uh, spacecraft radio uh, uh, on the bench, and we capture waveforms from it. We can also simulate transmission um, of, the, of a waveform from a ground station location, so you can, we can see how your receiver uh, works with that waveform. And we do this uh, primarily for radios that we haven't worked with before. Um, in the case where we work with a radio and have a known pattern for it, we'll, we'll bring that to bear and help you implement it right, really quickly. So a little bit about first mission. 
uh, first mission is, think of it as a workshop kind of offering. Um, and it, um, it's designed to get you and your team up to speed on the AWS fundamentals that are necessary for running an AWS ground station based solution. And then what we do is we do um, a training and readiness on ground station itself. We go in super depth on all the content that Russ and, and Nate have, have, have started to scratch the surface of. And then we work um, uh, on, on helping your team improve their capabilities by actually implementing a ground station based solution that takes downlink passes from NOAA's Aqua satellite. Um, this is based on content that can be found in a blog post and I've got links at the end. So you could actually get started on trying to do this solution for yourself and then if we need to work with your team um, uh, to give them a guided discovery experience through that whole process, we use this uh, first contact offering. And at the end of it, it's about a one to two week engagement um, depending upon your team's availability. Uh, your team will have implemented a, a, an ABS ground station solution and see all the moving parts in action. They'll have written mission profiles, they'll have worked on cloud formation templates uh, in order to uh, set these items up. Uh, so they'll have direct experience with doing it. We found that that's the best way of learning it. That leads us into first mission. And first mission is, uh, a, is a bespoke offering where we work with your spacecraft radio and your mission needs and we build the end end solution for both uplink and downlink. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, as I mentioned, if we've got uh, experience with your particular radio set, um, uh, that tends to go very, very quickly and we focus on the uh, mission data handling and the uh, uh, concept of operations and how we implement that best in AWS. Uh, we can work with classic deployment patterns using EC2. We've also implemented SDRs and containers. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to Lambda yet, uh, but I can see that uh, coming fairly quickly with sh for short duration contacts. But we certainly use serverless technology to help build cloud optimized solutions. Um, these engagements tend to last anywhere from two to 10 weeks, and the longer engagements are ones where there's a lot more pipeline to implement, or if it's with a radio that we don't have much experience yet, we often have to do research on how to best implement the demodulation, decoding, or mod cod scheme um, in, the, in the solution pattern. But the, the, as I was mentioning before, we're doing this side by side with your team. So as we're implementing this, they're learning the skills necessary to maintain it and also operate it uh, after ProServe is done with its work. And then as I was chatting about a little bit before, um, the pre-launch offering is where we, um, we work on a test plan for testing out the configuration and the modulation, uh, the mod cod scheme used by your specific radio. We have a, uh, a rack in a box. Uh, it's a Pelican case that we ship around to customers and we physically connect it up with the attenu attenuators and so on, because the last thing we want to do is blow up anybody's hardware, um, ours or yours. Um, but we, we actually capture a waveform from your radio uh, on that device, and then we run it through some ground station uh, lab capabilities to uh, determine if the ground station hardware itself can handle the demodulation decoding, or if we need to use an SDR-based solution. And if we have to use an SDR-based solution, um, uh, we'll use that recording um, to help design that SDR solution. Uh, we just had a case this week where um, uh, we tried for about three, four days to uh, get the ground station hardware to do, to do the demodulation and decoding. Um, it could demodulate, but it couldn't decode. We brought in a partner solution, and in 48 hours, they had one nailed and ready to deploy. Um, so a really good example of how this hardware saved a huge amount of time in determining, determining and implementing the best cloud-optimized pattern uh, for that mission. And as I mentioned, we bring that test kit on site. When we're done, we wheel it away. It's no impact on, uh, on your organization or capabilities going ahead. Um, a lot of customers are interested in that. We're also working with several SDR partners and radio manufacturers. Uh, and the benefit um, uh, of that to you is that uh, if we have a known pattern for, for a radio, we can say, look, we've got experience with this. We know it works. Um, this is going to save you a pile of time and effort to get to a solution that, that's working for your specific mission. Uh, and to date, we've worked uh, uh, with uh, uh, several of them, SatLab, um, we've worked with uh, Safran, uh, and a few others. So the theory is great, um, but hands-on experience is so much better. And so there's a, a set of QR codes on the right-hand side of the slide. 
The topmost one is a, is a link to a blog post for getting started, and it's implementing an Aqua XBand downlink uh, using uh, AWS Ground Station and actually producing images from, uh, from the MODIS instrument on board Aqua uh, and drop them right into your account. You can implement this today. Relatively, you still have to get onboarded, but the ground station team is already taking care of the spectrum licensing for it, so that's a fairly straightforward process. So you could implement a pipeline today. Um, if you're interested in a more advanced pipeline, uh, that's the uh, QR code, uh, uh, the second one down. And this one includes the right uh, cloud, uh, CloudWatch-based automations to start up the processor instance, to start up the receiver instance, and shut them down when the pass is completed. Um, so it's a little bit more complex, uh, but it's got uh, automations in it that uh, we typically implement in our bespoke solutions for customers. We've talked a lot about uh, digital intermediate frequency uh, based solutions and using Vita 49.2 uh, message streams. Uh, the third link is uh, a link to a, a blog post that was published just last week um, about architectures for implementing DigiRF solutions. Uh, so a lot of good information there, get you introduced to the concept, how it works with AWS Ground Station, and how we can make it work for you. And then the link at the bottom is um, a, a link uh, that sets you uh, up to get contacted by your AWS account manager about your interest in AWS Ground Station. Uh, so it's a nice little site there that you can use. Um, but bottom line is, uh, hands-on experience is always better. Uh, Dr. Vogels likes to say there's no compression alg algorithm for experience, and we found that to be especially true in helping lots of customers build AWS Ground Station-based solutions. So with that, um, just a reminder that, um, that there's a, a couple of good resor additional resources for in-demand AWS cloud skill development. Um, and the, 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 one of the QR code on the left is for um, our training and certification content. And the one on the right is uh, uh, links to new exam guides that are available for uh, you and your teams. So with that, um, thank you very much and we'll go into Q&A. Hi, this is Gian Delawari. That was a pretty impressive uh, prototype you built. Two questions. Uh, if you were running that prototype all the time for all the instruments on JPSS, what would be estimated cost to create the SDRs? If you don't have to answer today, but if you can maybe publish a paper or something, that would be nice for folks to know. And the second would be what region did you try that at? So uh, would have to do the math on that one. Uh, a lot of it really is going to be just driven by the number of contacts you're taking. Obviously, we're, we were taking passes as we're able to see it. If you're responsible for JPSS1 and you're getting the entire revolution, that's a lot more data. Uh, so some of it will just come down to um, you know, the, the number of minutes, hours, those EC2 instances are going to be running to, to chug through the data. But happy to sit down and kind of do that math uh, and think through it, uh, especially if you've got a particular use case you want to go through. I think the thing to note there is a lot of what that architecture was designed for was to be able to scale down very small when it's not being used. Uh, and so that's why I say the, the key factor there is going to be how many passes you're taking and how much processing time runs through the system uh, because um, for, um, uh, for radios and for all the different processing steps, it effectively scales back down to zero uh, uh, on everything except storage when it's not actively processing data. So the key factor is going to be, well, how much data are you processing how, and how, how much time does the system need to be up and operational for in different phases? Um, sorry, and I got rambling on. Can you repeat the second half of your question? <laughs> What region did we build it in? Uh, in that case, we had built it out in US West 2, um, but uh, there, there's, uh, as long as the services are available, you could have built it out uh, in any particular region. So it was all templated. Um, so the whole deployment takes about 45 minutes through the automation we had built to be able to deploy it. So we could stand it up uh, effectively anywhere in that period of time. Uh, this is kind of a, oh, thank you. Um, so what if you have your own ground station? How could you get that into the AWS network? I mean, the ground station is, is connected to AWS, but you know it has its own antenna and it has its own receivers, and I believe it's like a K-band uh, antenna. 
and also, um, can you go up to like a million uh, miles or a million kilometers from Earth in terms of, it seems like you're doing low Earth orbits. Can you do high Earth orbits? So generally speaking, we're focused on low Earth orbiting satellites. But what we would want to do is the link budget calculations, understand uh, how much EIRP the satellite has and how much what your receive threshold is, that sort of thing. Uh, we certainly can support higher than low Earth orbit, but it really is a case by case thing. Uh, as far as integrating non AWS ground stations with the service, we've had requests from customers to do that. Uh, and we're actively talking to some. Uh, you know, partners to, about that process. Um, and it's, you know, customers ask us, for example, to integrate our scheduling interface with their ground station uh, hardware and things like that. We're still working through what that would look like. So we'd like to hear more about what you would specifically like to do. Okay. It, follow up question on that. It, are, are you thinking about being able to take advantage of? like AWS's scheduling and APIs, or are you more interested in just, you know, I already have a ground station, I really just need to get my mission data into the cloud so I can, you know, take advantage of the cloud for processing? Scheduling first, and then, um, okay. and then the um, yep. scheduling APIs first. Got it, okay, understood. Yeah, great presentation. Have you guys uh, got any uh, metrics on the latency if you're doing an a asynchronous implementation from like Sydney to uh, Oregon West? In the case where, like, think in asynchronous, where you would have that data written to S3 and then pick it up from there, or? or yep. So the contact would be in Sydney, uh, use yep. your backbone, landed in Oregon West. So what would be the latency across to, uh, the contact across Sydney to back to Oregon West so we could start doing the processing? It's going to be a little different depending on whether you're delivering data to uh, an EC2 instance in the synchronous model that Nate talked about or you're delivering to an S3 bucket. We do have some data on that, which uh, I don't have a, the numbers off the top of my head, but we can share that with you. And the, the key factor there, like the dominant factor, is going to be propagation delay to get around the world, right? Um, so that, that's going to be the thing that generally matters the most in those use cases is just what's the, what's the latency of sort of light through fiber uh, to be able to get from Sydney back to Oregon. As, as Nate also mentioned, there is some additional buffering that goes on there too. We're, we're talking about tacking on a couple of seconds to the transit time. So it's not, uh, it's not a very substantial amount of delay. It, but. I was going to say you could do it like for like tests today, if with um, uh, with something running in Sydney and something running in US West too, and test the propagation delay. You just right, right, you know, do an, do an S3 right or an object creation and see how long it takes for it to show up over there. That's what we do often with customers when they're asking that same question. So we just prove it using their account. <laughs> do you have another question? Yes. Yeah. Earlier, I think you said that uh, cross-region delivery typically only goes between, on the co-located sites, the ones where there's an antenna and like uh, US uh, East 2. Uh, but you, I think you also said that you could do cross-region delivery to US East 1. Yes. Is that true for any of the ground stations? If I downlinked out of Sydney, could I bring it back to US East 1? Yes. Okay. Yep. Second question is, uh, and this is more road mapping, is there some thought into how this, how Ground Station will interface potentially with the Kuiper network to do more continuous downlinking and uplinking? So that's why I'm not able to answer that question right off the top of my head. We should probably get connected afterward and uh, have a discussion with the Ground Station service team about that, if, you know, with regard to your specific question. Yeah, I do know that the Ground Station team is always looking for again, more customer use cases to see if always on connectivity might be an option for a customer if there's a better way of doing it. So we're definitely interested in your use case. Can advance one slide. One thing uh, too that I want to mention, uh, it, we may have another question or two, but I, I also want to mention something I think that would be helpful for you to know. From an onboarding point of view, all we need from you to onboard you to the uh, broadcast satellites we've been talking about, like Aqua and Terra and JPSS1 and so on, is basically your name, your email address, your organization, and your AWS account number. That's it. And then it's, a, it's an automated process, it takes a day or two. So if you're thinking about it, um, it's really worth, you know, 
getting onboarded so you can run those blog post uh, scenarios and really get familiar with the service that way. Go ahead. Are you planning on or your customers asking for y'all providing your own C2 capabilities so that you can take plan maneuvers and put that into the contact schedule? Not sure I know what you mean. Could you? So yeah, if you, yeah. If you are, if you control the C2, then you are generating the, the predicted EFEMs um, that then go into the contact schedule, right? So you're, you're generating a more correct plan yeah. for a constellation or something. Yeah, so is your question, do we have that today? <laughs> do you have it or are you thinking about it? Is there, is there demand for that? Yes, there is demand for that. And yes, we, we have been working on uh, that and a number of other features that you'll see us announce as, they're, as they become, go, either go into preview or become publicly available. But all too often, customers bring their own C2 solution and we, integrate, we help them integrate it into Ground Station. Um, and so they're generating those command sequences and then we help them build the solution to turn that into a waveform and send. Okay, so yeah, different yeah. thing. Yeah, so my comments were more specific to ephemeris, right? Yeah. Well, and because we use, um, because we use NORAD ID and, and several public sources for ephemerides based on NORAD ID, and you've got the option to provide um, customer provided ephemeris as well, I think that if you're planning a maneuver, you probably know the impact of the ephemeris and that can be used too. So we're just about at time. I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today and for your great questions. And we look forward to, to working with you in the future.